And so the passive exposure in the market on my calculations has gone from less than 1% in the early 1990s to today it's somewhere in excess of 45% is the math that I come to. Right? And what that means is that now basically half the market in terms of its allocation is truly mindless in its mimicry of the supposed insights that are happening in capital allocation for the rest of the market. Again, doesn't necessarily sound like a terrible thing, right? Imagine the world where half of it is mimes, right? And half of it is really thoughtful people, right? So like that doesn't seem like it's certainly would be an annoying world, right? Filled with lots of people with white makeup, but we we don't necessarily see that as a huge problem until you recognize that that near 50-50 split camouflage is something far more dangerous, which is that all of the money that is going into the market is now passive, right? So to go from that less than 2%, that less than 1%, I'm sorry, to today's 45% or so means that every single year we're seeing the active discretionary managers on net get fired in size. Last year, even with the huge performance in the year, we saw somewhere around $300 billion worth of redemptions from active managers and somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars worth of inflows into passive vehicles. So all the money that's coming in is trying to mimic and all the money that is leaving is trying to be thoughtful. That's a really bad outcome. Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Mike Green, Portfolio Manager and Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management, a rapidly growing investment firm with a number of uniquely positioned ETS. We talk to Mike about the rise of passive investing and the implications for markets and investors. We then work into some of the strategies Simplify has developed and get some of Mike's thoughts on inflation, the Fed, value stocks, and more. As you'll quickly see, Mike is a deep thinker with comprehensive views on many different areas of the markets that investors can learn from. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Simplify's Mike Green. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Justin. Thanks for having me. One of the things that you've been talking about for uh, some time is the rise of passive investing and the impact that it has on the markets. Um, so that's where we want to spend, I think, the first part of the conversation with you today is understanding how we got here with passive and the investment implications that it has um, now and in the future. Um, I think on the second part of the uh, podcast, I think we want to kind of get an understanding and hear from you some of the investment strategies you're working on at Simplify and also some of your perspective on the current market environment and how investors should be thinking about sort of the times we're in and how they're positioned um, today. So clearly we have a lot of ground to cover. So you ready? Absolutely. All right. So the first thing we wanted to just to frame this up, I think, is to hear how you first started really doing this deep dive research on passive investing. How did you come up with the initial idea? What brought you here in the first place? Well, so to be entirely honest, I had not given that much thought to the dynamics of passive until roughly 2016. And I was aware of the growth of passive. I was aware of the arguments behind it. I was you know, more than aware, obviously, you know, extraordinarily familiar with the arguments behind it. Um, and in 2016, a couple of interesting papers came out. One was from Inigo Fraser Jenkins at um, uh, Alliance Bernstein. And this was this idea that passive investing is worse than Marxism, right? That at least in Marxism, there's a central planner who is theoretically allocating capital or allocating resources to some directed objective. Um, Inigo's point was that in passive investing, you've removed even that degree of thoughtfulness and you've basically left it up to a pure market force. Now, I, I had less concern about that, but I that was aware that there were definitely some concerns that existed in that framework. This idea that passive investing removes effectively the activist manager or the value manager from being able to influence the behavior of a, of a corporate entity um, and by extension, improve the allocation of capital in a really fundamental sense across the economy. 
at the, that same year, a much less celebrated paper came out um, by Lasse Peterson at AQR, and it was called Sharpening the Arithmetic of Active Management. And this paper took a totally different approach to evaluating the dynamics of active versus passive. It was focused on the question of can active outperform passive? And so Lasse introduced a thought experiment in which he framed the original paper by Bill Sharp written in 1991 called The Arithmetic of Active Management that laid out the case that if passive managers return the same as active managers in aggregate, which they theoretically are supposed to because they're both the market, right? So all the active managers together make up the market and then passive is theoretically just mimicking that. So Lasse's point was that um, the definition of passive embedded within Sharp's paper is that a passive manager never transacts, right? And an active manager is any manager who transacts. And he pointed out that on index reconstitution events, so a new inclusion in the S&P or a Russell rebalancing, that the indices themselves change and therefore a passive index investor has to enter the market and has to transact. And therefore they cease being active for that time period that creates the conditions under which active managers could theoretically outperform them, right? What I recognized with Lasse's paper was that he had understated the magnitude of the issue, which is that active managers transact every single day and every single day that they receive flows, passive managers transact. And so it wasn't just index reconstitution under which active passive managers became active managers but it's literally any time they receive a, an inflow or an outflow or redemption, they by definition have to be passive. Since that's happening every single day, they by definition have to be active. Since that's happening every single day, there is no such thing as a passive investor. And so I was able to reframe the question and effectively attack it from a very different angle of saying, I know they're not passive. I know they're influencing the market. So now how can I identify and prove this point? How can I identify what their impact is? And so that's when I became really, really interested in it. Um, in 2017, as I was pushing on this index dynamic, uh, one of the, the really interesting developments was the explosion of the inverse volatility ETFs, in particular, something called XIV. And this was basically just a mechanism for shorting the VIX, right? And taking advantage of certain characteristics, but it was the definition of systematic passive investing. They had a built in algorithm that said, this is exactly what we're gonna do based on this type of behavior in the market. And as I began to dig in and focus on this dynamics, these dynamics around passive, I realized that this strategy had become so large that it was actually influencing the underlying behavior in the market right, that it was having a very clear effect. And, and this was demonstrated, I could actually uh, send you a slide, you can show this, in the beta, right, so the response, the linear response of the volatility indices to changes in the S&P, which are supposed to be basically linear in their response, right, so a predictable relationship had begun to decouple as this strategy became too crowded. And so the beta of the VIX began to rise, or more accurately, the UX futures began to rise. They became riskier and riskier and riskier, twitchier and twitchier, responding more and more to relatively small moves in the S&P 500. And I constructed my first trades around the passive thesis in that volatility space, betting that the XIV would blow up. There were options that allowed me to do that in a non-linear, uh, very convex fashion. And in, in a weird twist of fate, was actually delivering a, uh, uh, a speech at a conference in which I highlighted some of these dynamics. And in the audience was the founder of this product who proceeded to get into an argument with me and tell me that I had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't understand the product, etc. It was such a colorful argument that somebody decided to record it. And so this was actually after the XIV blew up, which I had predicted would happen on a 4% decline in the S&P. It happened on a 3.9% decline in the S&P. Um, this was released out into the wild and you know created some of the notoriety around this, this type of thesis that then allowed me to push much further in terms of the exploration. 
So, so, so that's the very long-winded story of the background. Can you help us understand how big passive, where we've come from with passive in, in terms of the percentage growth over time? Yeah. So this is one of these things that is actually really, um, it's actually really fascinating because I can present it as being a relatively small problem or passive being a relatively small component of the market. And I can also explain that it's giant, right? And so on a small argument, if I look at things like mutual funds and ETFs, um, the share that Vanguard holds, quote unquote, openly, for example, right? It appears that passive strategies are somewhere around 15 to 20% of the market. That's basically the retail ownership through ETFs and mutual funds. There's an entirely separate component of the market, though, that is actually much more passive than the retail side. So the retail side has become increasingly passive as 401ks and IRAs and registered investment advisors have been encouraged to guide their clients towards low cost indexing products. But this happened a long time before and has reached much greater penetration in the institutional space. So if you think about your college that you attended, I almost guarantee you that if you call up the CIO of that endowment, they will tell you that they have a passive allocation for US equities that's held in the form of either a total return swap or in the form of what's called a CIT, a commingled investment trust, basically an unregistered um, mutual fund or in the form of a separate account, et cetera, right? So, so all of these strategies incorporate passive components to them that'll then extend further into all the variable annuity products and most insurance products, most structured products are using passive references, futures products, et cetera. And so the passive exposure in the market on my calculations has gone from less than 1% in the early 1990s to today, it's somewhere in excess of 45% is the math that I come to, right? And what that means is that now basically half the market in terms of its allocation is truly mindless in its mimicry of the supposed insights that are happening in capital allocation for the rest of the market. Again, doesn't necessarily sound like a terrible thing, right? Imagine the world where half of it is mimes, right? And half of it is really thoughtful people, right? So. Like that doesn't seem like it's certainly would be an annoying world, right? Filled with lots of people with white makeup, but we, we don't necessarily see that as a huge problem until you recognize that that near 50, 50 split camouflage is something far more dangerous, which is that all of the money that is going into the market is now passive, right? So to go from that less than 2%, that less than 1%, I'm sorry, to today's 45% or so, means that every single year we're seeing the active discretionary managers on net get fired in size. Last year, even with the huge performance in the year, we saw somewhere around $300 billion worth of redemptions from active managers and somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars worth of inflows into passive vehicles. So all the money that's coming in is trying to mimic and all the money that is leaving is trying to be thoughtful. That's a really bad outcome. One of the things that you pointed out is, is the changes that have been made in the 401k space with, I think, these automatic opt-ins and the vehicles that they are putting the investors or putting forward as the best vehicles for investors. So can you just talk to that a little bit? So one of the one of the dynamics that exists within passive, right, is, is that when you decide to buy the S&P 500, there are two reasons why you could decide to buy it. You could decide to buy the S&P 500 and all of the stocks that are in the S&P 500, all 505 stocks that are in the S&P 500 in proportion to their market capitalization. And you could decide to do that because you think that stocks are a really good thing to buy, right? Because it's March 2009 and stocks are really cheap. That's less of a concern, right? That discretionary thought process where you're actually applying some allocation schema that says, I think this is a good idea right? That's not such a huge deal, although it does contribute to things like increased correlation of securities, etc., for very obvious reasons. If I decide to buy everything altogether or sell everything altogether, then they're going to behave more like each other than if I was deciding to just buy one and buy another one or sell one, etc., right? So you're seeing a rise in correlation associated with that, but at least it's somewhat thoughtful in its capital allocation process.
The thing that really changed is in 2006 and then in 2012, as you highlight, the 401k space changed significantly. And it shifted from what used to be an opt-in system where if you were employed, you had to make a decision to allocate to a 401k and then you had to choose what you were going to allocate to. And then on top of that, you had to be a, a, an investment expert because you were expected to maintain a certain allocation or change your allocation over time. And the data was fairly straightforward that the vast majority of people just did nothing, right? So when they went in initially, they were getting things like cash, right? They'd get a money market mutual fund and only after several years on the job would they wake up and be like, oh, I wonder how my investments are doing. Wait, I'm still in cash. I, I didn't change anything. So in 2006, that changed with the introduction of what's called a qualified default investment alternative. That qualified default investment alternative is the uh, product that you automatically default into when you go into your corporate 401k. And likewise, the 401ks themselves changed from opt in. In other words, I had to make an active choice to participate to opt out. I had to make an active choice not to participate, right? So that dramatically increased the amount of capital that flowed into the markets. Initially, they went in through things like balanced funds, like the 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 um, uh, PIMCO's, you know, uh, total return type products, right? Where it's a mixture of bonds and equities. And then in 2012, that default changed to what's called a target date fund. And a target date fund is a systematic allocation process that literally asks one question, when do you plan to retire, right? And with that one piece of information then chooses how to allocate all of your capital, right? So everybody who plans to retire at the same time gets basically the same underlying allocation schema. That now has changed something radically because instead of me thoughtfully saying, hey, I wanna buy the S&P 500 because I think stocks are cheap, it literally now is a every two weeks I buy the S&P 500, not because I think stocks are cheap, but because I have a job, right? That's changed the character of the market quite significantly and turned it into a very pro-cyclical dynamic. As long as people are getting more jobs, as long as more money is flowing in, you're seeing the dynamics of the S&P 500 or other risk exposures being bought on a continuous basis simply because people are employed. So you, we, we have this setup of more flows coming into passive um, and obviously passive is becoming more of the market. And you've talked about some of the other impacts. I mean, you mentioned the increased correlation in securities, um, but actually, I, and I was watching a, um, a really great presentation you gave in November of last year which we'll put um, some of the slides in, as you already mentioned, but I think there was this core slide that you worked off for the entire presentation and it was passive investing impacts the markets. And you had five different um, areas where passive investing was impacting. The first is increased correlation to securities. Um, and I'll let you comment on these. I don't wanna have to just list them out for you, but I'm sure you remember what they are, but can you kind of work through what the major impacts are here for passive? Sure. So, so the increase in correlation is the first one, and it's it's very simply saying if everybody decides to en masse buy the S&P 500 or everybody decides en masse to buy the Vanguard Total Market Index or the BlackRock Total Market Index, which are the same, um, then you would expect the buying pressure and selling pressure to be coordinated in a similar fashion. And the slide that you'll post up shows the history of correlation holding volatility constant all the way back into the 1920s. Um, you know, there's some tricks around how to calculate that data set back over a very long period of time. But when your viewers see that chart, they'll see that we have entered into an unprecedented regime of extraordinarily high volatility that we've just never seen before, right? Um, so the, the evidence for that is quite compelling. Uh, the second big impact is, is that as passive investing grows, it actually drives higher and higher valuations. And that happens for two reasons. One is because passive indices are constructed on a market cap weighted basis, and there's some wrinkles around that, but by and large, it's a market cap weighted basis. When that happens, what it means is, is that you are allocating more capital and by more, I mean M-O-R-E, not the firm more capital, but you know, you're adding higher levels of capital to stuff that goes up more, right? So the momentum stocks receive more capital than the value stocks on just a structural basis. And this happens over time in a 
somewhat um, predictable fashion. When you reinforce momentum, when you buy more of stuff that has gone up more in price, you're almost inevitably contributing to a rise in valuation. And the data supports this very, very clearly. Um, there is some proprietary analysis that I've done around this that effectively tries to build you know, what in, account, what in economic terms you'd think of as supply and demand curves for equities. The behavior of passive strategies is what's referred to as perfectly inelastic. If you give them money, they will buy regardless of valuations. What will they buy the most of? Whatever went up most in the past, right? And so this drives dynamics of increased concentration in markets as well as an increase in valuations. The second thing that happens is because passive strategies don't try to time the market, they don't or, or aren't looking for opportunities to deploy cash on a discretionary basis, they don't carry any cash. And this is one of these things that people tend not to think about in terms of the structure of the market. Your typical active discretionary manager will carry about 5% in cash. Your typical passive vehicle will carry around 10 basis points in cash. The world's largest passive index fund, the Vanguard Total Market Index, it's about $1.6 trillion in total market cap and it carries no cash. It actually had negative $100 million in cash at one point last year because it utilizes a line of credit in order to facilitate redemptions. Now that doesn't necessarily seem that it should lead to a huge change in the market structure, but if you just mechanically think about what would happen if somebody came up to you and pointed a gun in your face and said, buy equities or I'm gonna shoot you, right? What is the, what is the price that you will pay for equities? Well, guess what, it's higher. Right. And so this is actually the mechanical impact of that loss of cash. It drives it's it's the equivalent of basically placing the entire market under duress and say, no, put this cash to work. Right. And so that is another contributor to this increase in valuations. And one of the things that you'll see is you guys, I'm sure will share is this pattern of rising valuations as passive gains share. And that's one of the things that I just want to emphasize over and over again is the key difference in my work versus a lot of the work that was done earlier and the academic community is now catching up and a lot of the papers that are coming out are very supportive of the analysis that I've done. It's not so much the share of passive that matters as the flow dynamics associated with passive. So when passive is gaining share, that means all the money that is coming in effectively is behaving in this new manner and changing the structure of the market quite dramatically. Another, so as we're running through the, the five factors that you highlighted, increase in correlation between securities, increase in valuation of securities, regardless of fundamentals. The next one is an increase in market concentration. Again, this is that feedback loop. The stuff that goes up gets more capital allocated to it and therefore it goes up more in the next move, right? And so this contributes to the dynamics that we've seen, the rise of these extraordinary giants. Another way that passive influences markets is reduced ability for new companies to become public. So the traditional IPO has by and we remember from 99, 2000 has by and large gone away. And that's actually a really important recognition because what a company going public means is a discretionary manager says, I'm going to take a risk and deviate from my benchmark because I, I value and I think this company has the potential to outperform and help me achieve my objective of outperforming the benchmark. Well, if you take all the money away from the discretionary managers, there's nobody left, right? There's nobody left to take the risk on that IPO. When you look at behaviors that we saw in 2020 and 2021, things like special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs, those are actually explainable under my theories because SPACs have a unique feature to them they, if done in sufficient size, become almost immediately eligible for index providers to buy into them. And so if you look at the largest holders of what I would argue are broadly outright frauds, things like a Nikola or, you know, many of these SPACs, uh, Clover Health, for example, many of these SPACs that went public to much fanfare with very poor business fundamentals, if any business fundamentals, Lordstown Motors, I mean, we can go on and on. If you look at the largest holders, in many situations, they're the passive vehicles that have bought in mechanically once these things became part of the indices. Um, 
And then the last point that I make is, is this dynamic of what's referred to as reduced market elasticity. So elasticity is basically how much does supply and demand change on the basis of price. You know, when you reduce elasticity or increase inelasticity, you raise the risk of extraordinary price movements. And again, I would point to the dynamics of passive. There's a academic paper that came out just in the last year by Valentin Haddad at UCLA. I'll provide you with a link to it. And his direct quote is, index investors are perfectly inelastic, right? As we grow them, the market is becoming increasingly inelastic. And I would put, I would point to things like AMC or GameStop. Again, if you look at who the largest buyers were of these, once they explode in price, the largest buyers have to be Vanguard, BlackRock, et cetera. And that's exactly what we saw. On your point about the the melt ups and the meltdowns, I mean, one of the, this was maybe the most eye opening thing of all your research for me because you're not talking about you know a twenty percent decline or a thirty percent decline or a twenty percent increase or a thirty percent increase. I mean, you're talking about the market could go up five x or down like Great Depression levels, right? Isn't isn't that the degree of what you think could happen if this keeps growing? Yes, and 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 I understand that that is incredibly distressing to people, but the way I describe it is we are in a car that is driving uphill with no brakes, right? doesn't matter as long as you're going uphill. Once you start going downhill, that's when you really miss those brakes, right? Um, so, you know, the warnings were largely ignored on the way up. And now as we're going down, I would, would argue that a lot of people are like, what in the world is going on? Well, you're starting to see some of the dynamics of a market that is extraordinarily exposed to market participants who only buy if they receive cash, right? There is no cash held in reserve. There is no, hey, I think Palantir is really cheap now that it's fallen from 35 or $40 to $9 or $7, whatever the number is right now. Or I really think that Microsoft having fallen 20% or Apple having fallen 20% or um, any number of energy companies, like there's just no analysis that's actually being done on that. Vanguard is not, that's not entirely true. They do have active funds, but there's nobody sitting there at the Vanguard Index Fund who's like, wow, did you see that Apple earnings report? That's a really great earnings report. We should buy more Apple. They don't care. They just don't care. Is there, this might be a question that could be its own podcast in of itself, but is, is there any way to fix this? So the, the challenge I would think is from the perspective of the individual investor, passive makes a lot of sense. You know, you have the whole argument about what 80% of active funds underperform or something like that. So from, with each one of those individual decisions, the decision to go passive makes sense. But as each one of those individual decisions get made, this rises up and up to being a major problem. So it seems like, you know, if you think about those individual decisions, it's very hard to fix this as it's growing. Is, is that an accurate way to look at it? It, it? It's a fantastically accurate way to look at it. And there's all sorts of feedback loops associated with what you're referring to. Uh, among other things I talk about in the presentation is if my theories are right, part of the reason why those active managers are underperforming more and more is because of the growth of passive. It actually creates a what's referred to as a nonlinear feedback system where we've effectively created an active manager killing machine. Um, you, you know, you're, you're constantly picking up pennies in front of a steamroller as an active manager where one mistake versus the market can wipe out your career. Um, that feels like the world's smallest violin is playing until you understand that actually the narrative that exists for most participants is the exact opposite, right? Which is passive is really good for the markets because it forces the active managers to be more efficient. It forces them to be better at their jobs. Well, I, I'm going to lay it out there and just be entirely honest with you. Like nobody gets better at their jobs when they're operating under duress, right? Like this is, this is, this is a fundamentally flawed dynamic. And I would actually point to those statistics to tell you that something is wrong. Right, because the simple reality is, is if your kid comes home and tells you, hey dad, I failed my math test. And you're like, wow, okay, we should probably get you a tutor, like that's unacceptable, you know, or let's sit down at the kitchen table and we'll, we'll figure out what you got wrong or did you talk to your, your teacher, et cetera, right? Like that's our immediate reaction to it. But if your son then says, yeah, 98% of the kids failed the test your reaction suddenly shifts to like, well, there's something wrong with the test then, or the teacher's not doing a good job, right? And so that's the world that we inhabit is people have basically come to the conclusion that 
that, and this may be totally unrelated, right? I mean, I might be an idiot and I might be, you know, incapable of doing my job well. But if everybody's failing, there's something wrong with the way we've constructed the test. I want to ask you, before we move, I want to ask you about Simplify, some of the strategies you've built for this sort of type of environment. But before you do, as a quant, I'm always thinking about factors. And I'm wondering if there's a factor here. So one thing you could obviously do if you wanted to take advantage of this as an investor is you could just buy the passive funds that are continuing to drive up the prices of these stocks. And you, you probably would do pretty well with that. But another thing I thought about is, is there some sort of factor where you think about maybe the float adjusted market cap as the measure of how much is flowing in and then some measure of liquidity on the other side in terms of each stock and how much it could take in terms of the flows. I mean, do you think there's like strategies that could be built around this that could take advantage of this? Yes. And so that's that's part of what we've tried to do. Right. So um, the dynamic that you just articulated, right, the mismatch between effectively the flows and liquidity um, is extraordinarily well documented in a, another paper that came out in 2021 um, by a gentleman, Bouchaud, who's a, a hedge fund and somewhat of an academic out of Europe. He highlights the, the reality that almost all market participants know, which is that liquidity does not scale with market cap. Liquidity scales with the volume that is traded and the volatility of the security. Because the liquidity of, let's just take Apple, for example, right? So Apple has roughly a $2 trillion market cap. Um, the smallest stock in the S&P 500, it used to be Delta Airlines, I don't know what it is today, but you know it's roughly $20 billion in market cap the relative liquidity between those two is not 100x more for Apple, right? But Vanguard, when they try to should deploy into the S&P 500 or BlackRock, I don't mean to pick on Vanguard in particular or any index fund for that matter. Um, when they try to deploy, they're trying to buy 100 times as much Apple in dollar value as they are Delta, right? Because of that liquidity mismatch, that liquidity does not scale. It actually means that there's more impact happening on Apple than on Delta. Now, the, the unfortunate implications of this is all else being equal, the largest stocks are going to continue to outperform under this framework, right? And so traditional factors that we've thought of, things like small and value, become extraordinarily challenged except for brief periods of recovery after, you know, when passive is gaining share in this way. And so part of what I would argue is the relative underperformance of value and small has not been a function of the Fed or inflation or anything else. It's actually been a function of the dynamics of passive. Um, in terms of what you can do around that, you know, one of the very obvious things, and this is you know where my strategies kick in, if my theories are correct, then the market is actually increasingly inefficient and there is a drift component associated with markets that is not properly priced into option structures. And the reason that that becomes very powerful is option structures allow you to do what you should do if these theories are right, which is lever your exposure to the top side while minimizing your exposure to the downside. Effectively put seat belts in that car that's driving uphill with no brakes. But you gotta stay in the car, right? And that's, that, that, that's it, you know, it's it's an unfortunate reality that most of us would like to avoid but if these theories are correct you know then we actually could enter into an environment in which valuations rise to levels that we never imagined just never imagined hopefully there's airbags airbags too if we want airbags too mm -hmm. right as well as a ramp and you know all sorts of you know mm -hmm. wouldn't wouldn't be bad to have a parachute because <laughs> maybe there's cliffs you know who knows right but we want a James Bond car is basically what we want in these conditions. And, you know, one of the interesting things you guys have done is, you know, we've, we've found that a lot of times in terms of behavior, it's really good to sort of give investors what everybody else has, which is kind of the S&P 500. But then you've coupled that with things that might do well, you know, in, in this type of scenario. So, you know, tail protection on both the up and the downside. Can you just talk about a little bit about the products you've built um, that might work in this kind of environment? Sure. So, so the, the general idea behind what we're trying to do is taking advantage of a, a regulatory change that was introduced. And you'll hear this a lot as you hear me talk that, you know, I believe that regulators play a much larger role than people fully understand. Right. So things like the DOL fiduciary rule, things like the qualified default investment alternatives associated with target date funds, et cetera, those 
it should be very clear that I think those things really do matter in a very meaningful way. Um, the, the, the strategies that we're deploying um, are the traditional beta exposures, things like the S&P 500 or US equities as we refer to it. Um, and then we're using derivative strategies to modify those exposures. And so in the case of our flagship product, SPD, the US equities with downside protection, we are actively buying a portfolio that is composed of the S&P roughly 97% and then give or take two or 3% deployed in various forms of tail risk protection with the objective being not to protect you against the first 5% down or even 10% down, but to really protect you against the potentially catastrophic outcomes that could occur in a 2008, for example. Um, other strategies that we have involved similar construction within credit. So our high yield product, uh, CDX, offers a equity long short overlay that is designed to go long, higher quality equities with strong balance sheets and short companies that are heavily exposed to refinancing cycles. That's actually working Today would be a perfect example where the higher quality equities as the S&P is down, give or take two and a half percent, you know, the higher quality equities in my portfolio are, are down only one and a half percent while the junk related stuff, the stuff that needs to tap the capital markets for refinancing, they're down in foreign change today, right? So, so what we're seeing right now is a very clear articulation, articulation coming through the market saying, wait a second, guys, like, we could very realistically run into a true credit crisis here. The high yield markets have by and large been shut for two to three months now, as most corporations that have borrowed in the high yield space are increasingly finding themselves incapable of actually affording the increase in interest rates, right? They're like the subprime borrowers of 2006 and 2007. Um, uh, you know, other, other products that we offer, um, we actually have uh, income products that flip a lot of these arguments on their head and basically say in an environment of very elevated volatility, um, products like SVOL uh, allow you to take advantage of the short volatility trade as a yield enhancement product. Um, and, and by and large, like you should just think about what Simplify is trying to do is offer the exposures that you're traditionally used to taking advantage of some of these theories to modify the payouts to protect downside, enhance upside, increase yield, etc., all while being very cognizant that the underlying structure of the market is more fragile than it has been historically. I want to ask you about the idea of fundamental investing in general. You know, one of the things I try to do is put together the ideas of different guests we've had on here. And, you know, you're talking about the fact that we have these flows that don't care about fundamentals. You know, we had Ben Hunt on here and he, he talked about how he thinks narrative is driving the market a lot more than fundamentals these days. And then when you have the options guys on, they'll talk about how much, you know, option dealer flows are driving the market. And I'm wondering, and this seems like a ridiculous question when I ask it, but is, is there any point in analyzing companies' fundamentals anymore and deciding to invest, you know, based on that? Or, I mean, is this really a market where you really just have to look at flows and, and things like that? And, you know, fundamental investing is kind of dying. Well, so, so here's the point that I would make about fundamental investing, which is, is that the market has always been about flows. It's always been the Keynesian beauty contest of figuring out what other people are going to find valuable in the future, right? Because when I buy, you sell. Um, when I look to sell and monetize, I have to find somebody who is suddenly convinced that something is worth more than I paid for it initially, right? Now, fundamentals can be super, super powerful in a Phil Fisher, common stocks, uncommon profits type framework where I can identify a company that is growing, that is likely to offer significantly increased income, that the dividends that are paid out over time are going to dwarf what I've contributed into this company, et cetera, right? And so this would be the Apples, this would be the Microsofts, et cetera, of the world. Uh, the vast majority of time, you know, there's very few companies where the fundamentals matter in that way, right? And, you know, this research, the research that's out there basically points out things like if you take away four or five stocks from the US equity markets, like all of the gains basically disappear, right? Um, if you get those names right, and you do that fundamental analysis right, you're gonna win. And I would just, I, I, I can't encourage people, that's by the way, that's my background, I came out of that space. 
like read Phil Fisher's Common Stocks Un Uncommon Profits. It's probably available in a used paperback, you know, being discarded in somebody's gar uh, garage sale. It's one of the greatest books you can ever read on investing. I cannot emphasize that enough. But for the vast majority of people who are, you know, kind of casually looking at this and saying, you know, wow, I really think that energy stocks are going to go up, or I really think the financials are going to outperform given the steepness or flatness of the yield curve, or the fact that interest rates are going up, whatever. You inevitably are entering into a trade in which you're assuming somebody else doesn't have the right information, right? Doesn't know what they're doing. And so it becomes really hard to actually argue that fundamental investing works in that framework. Like if you're Seth Klarman and you can analyze these companies and you can figure out what their future cash flows are going to be and you can identify like, man, you're going to crush it. But guess what? Seth Klarman's already crushed it and already crushing it. And even he was struggling in it to an extraordinary fashion over the past several years. Right. So it's a really tough environment. And the next thing that I would point out is, you know, Anytime anyone's choosing to change their allocation or buy a new stock, sell a new stock based on fundamentals, what they're actually doing is driving flows, right? They're taking information and then driving flows. And you expect the price behavior to change on the basis of that. Um, so I, like, I, I, I wish I could turn around and say, like, all we should be doing is fundamental analysis. But that's actually then highlighting a point that I also make, which is I, I actually don't think that passive is the you know, it's not the end of the world. It's not the worst thing that's ever happened. It's just the worst thing that's ever happened because we're allowing it to grow and metastasize and giving it advantages to the point that we can't actually reverse this process, right? So, so my research actually says that passive share gain up to about 20 to 25% was actually an unmitigated good for the market. It forced asset management fees lower it actually reduces volatility in markets because I increase the heterogeneity, the diversity of investment types. It's extraordinarily valuable to introduce into a, a you know, experiment, a, an investor who basically has the world's simplest rules. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. Like that type of diversity can actually be really helpful in the provision of liquidity and reducing volatility in a market. But when it becomes the dominant vehicle, when it becomes the only game in town to the extent that it has today, where everything is about, it doesn't really matter. You can't find a skilled manager. They don't exist simply by the indices because they're lower cost and you're going to outperform over time that the system starts to break down. As we shift to the end of the interview here, I wanted to ask you about the current market a little bit and about inflation in the Fed and a few other things around what's going on in the economy. Um, the first thing I want to ask you about is sort of the comparison that a lot of fundamental guys like me are making, which is when, when we look back to the 2000 to 2002 period, we're basically seeing the same thing here. So we're seeing a market, you know, that may be in for an extended bear market. We're seeing high, you know, valuation companies getting killed and maybe having a long way to go. And then we're seeing, you know, we hope at least we, we're seeing a period where small cap value might outperform for an extended period of time. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you see in terms of the the similarities and the differences between what happened in 2000 and what's going on now. So I think there's actually a lot more similarities than people actually want to accept. Um, you know, my analysis of what transpired in 2000 is that it, the dot-com cycle perversely was actually kicked off by what I call indexing 1.0. Right. And so if you go back and you look at the construction of the indices prior to 2004, indices like the S&P 500 or um, even the, you know, the Wilshire 5000 sort of thing, they were constructed where the market capitalizations included shares that were held by insiders. Right. So low float stocks. And perversely, if you think about the growth of passive investing that allocates on the basis of market capitalization, what that meant was in the mid 1990s, you had companies like Microsoft and Cisco and Dell, where they had relatively high market caps, but only about half the shares were actually publicly traded. So what that meant was when Vanguard went out to try to buy the market cap weight of Microsoft, they were actually buying twice as many shares as were actually available to trade. That causes Microsoft to outperform. That causes those who are allocated to Microsoft to outperform we call those people technology funds, right, in, in that structure. And so their outperformance attracted additional flows and facilitated the dynamics of the dot-com cycle. 
Where that became clear to me was in the behavior of the, I certainly didn't figure that out in 2000. If I had, I'd, I'd you know, be far, 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 far wealthier today. Um, but the, the simple reality is, is that I didn't figure that out until 2015, when I was watching the behavior of the Shanghai stock market, which basically between November of 2014 and June of 2015 rose 500%. And the, the narrative was that this was, you know, the equitization of China, that China was going to rule the world, that everything was going great. And actually what was happening was something far more prosaic, which is Western, you know, developed market managers were trying to allocate to China because they basically figured that China was the growth market of the future. They would try to allocate through futures that were traded in Singapore. The futures brokers in Singapore would then go onshore into China and try to replicate the index because they're not taking a directional exposure against it. They want to hedge out their exposure. And then they were running into the challenge that the construction of the Chinese stock market indices was functionally identical to what we saw in the U.S. in 1999, where you had a number of companies that had very low floats relative to their market caps. The most extreme version of this was a single company that we were tracking that had only 5% of its shares outstanding. And because it was part of the index, every single day, the index um, arbitrageurs, those who are creating the index shares in the futures in Singapore, the brokers would effectively go and try to buy exposure to this to replicate the index, replicate the futures positioning. And what was actually happening is because there was so little liquidity in this name, they would go in, they'd try to buy, it would immediately go limit up and no transactions would happen. And then the next day they'd try to do it again, it would go limit up, no transactions would happen. Well, in this one stock, which is the most extreme, for 32 days in a row with zero transactions, it went limit up, so up 10% every single day. So 1.1 to the 32nd power with zero transactions, right? That's, I think the technical term is a big number, right? And that was actually what was driving the Chinese stock market it was the exact same behavior that we saw in the US stock market in 1999, where the thin liquid, illiquid IPOs, et cetera, were propelling the indices and the market and the technology sector higher, even as they were functionally sucking cash out of the rest of the market. Um, at one point, by the way, something like 15 to 20% of the Shanghai market was experiencing these sort of limit up dynamics with no transactions, right? So like, Nothing was actually happening. It was just purely an artifact. That same dynamic in 2000 drove the dot-com cycle. And when indices went or when allocators went to rebalance, basically saying, oh, okay, our technology names have gotten so out of whack, we need to now reduce our allocation. That's what caused the crash in the NASDAQ. The exact same thing that caused the crash in the Shanghai where it fell, you know, give or take 80% over the next couple of months. Um, so this has been with us for a very long time. It's just the structure of the market matters significantly. And do you think, so you've talked about how you really don't see the opportunity in small cap value right now that you saw back in 2000. Is a lot of that a function of passive and the fact that the money, more money is going to the bigger companies? Well, no, so a lot, so there's two components to it. One is we change the structure of the market. So they actually are now receiving basically their proportion the problem is, as, I, as we talked about early on, the liquidity doesn't scale in the same fashion. So ironically, the smaller stuff, you have less impact from passive than the larger stuff. The second um, issue that I, that I highlight is, you know, Ben Hunt brings up this dynamic of narrative, and I think that's a brilliant observation because what is ultimately happening, and we saw this in spades in the 2016 election of Donald Trump, and again with the 2020 election of Biden, we decide to construct a narrative, right? So, so rethink the elections in both situations as various people in different political camps face uncertainty. Trump supporters are like, oh, you know, if Biden is elected, oh my gosh, we're going to have terrible taxes and, and the economy is going to go into free fall, right? And on the flip side, you have Justin Wolfers, a professor from the University of Michigan, who does a study and announces if Donald Trump is elected, uh, the stock market is going to crash because I've tracked the behavior during the debates and this is this is its reaction function, right? Well, neither of those was actually correct, right? And the reason why was very straightforward. It resolved uncertainty. And so all that was required was the active managers to decide, okay, the narrative has now been resolved. The uncertainty is finished. 
therefore I'm going to go buy X. And it actually doesn't even matter what X is, right? The process of going to buy it into this illiquid market in which the passive investors are not willing to increase their supply of securities and sell you stuff that you're trying to bid up causes the market to behave in this way. So you get this dynamic with small cap value, which is exactly what's played out. It explodes upward following the election of Biden in a completely unpredictable way or quote unquote unpredictable way where I was like, wow, well, that was bizarre what just happened. And now it's gone sideways for, you know, basically since uh, February of 2021, right? Like there's been no returns associated with it, even as the S&P marched to a new all time high in, in December and January of 2021, 2022, right? Um, so that's the point that I'm making. It's not that I criticize small cap value as a strategy. It's just, it, it's a strategy that is uniquely subject to this dynamic of narrative where the active managers wake up, they're like, oh, I got it figured out. And they haven't figured it out. It's just, they're choosing to allocate capital that gives them momentary positive feedback. And then at the end of the day, you're trapped because the people that have chosen to invest alongside you, the thoughtful discretionary investor who says, the election of Biden means X, well, they're still getting fired, right? And so they now become the weak hands and all the money goes to Vanguard and BlackRock and it's coming out of the active managers again, meaning that small cap value gets sold as large cap gets growth, large cap gets bought. Just a couple of economic questions before I hand it back to Justin for the end. Um, I want to ask you about inflation. Um, there seem to be two camps right now. One camp is sort of we've reached peak inflation and we're going to start to see a decline here. The other camp seems to be this is going to be with us for a very, very long time. And I'm just wondering where you fall on that. So I, I think this is one of these really, really unfortunate situations where the language that has been used um, is, is, is damaging to the actual underlying phenomenon, right? So the Fed, I think correctly, adopted the language that inflation would prove to be transitory, that the underlying characteristics that contributed to the inflation of the 1970s and a significant outward shift in the aggregate demand curve created by a sustainable demographic shift, just more people showing up, all of whom need more stuff, right? Women suddenly being able to form their own households, minorities being able to participate in a formal economy, with far greater purchasing power, access to credit, et cetera. Those were the things that drove the 1970s inflation, that durable dynamic to it. Those are not in place today. And so my expectation is, is that what we're seeing is a restructuring of supply chains away from the traditionally low cost oversupplied regions of, of places like China and increasingly into higher cost regions that require effectively prices to rise on a one-off basis. But I'm not seeing that sustainable framework, right? That says this is an accelerating phenomenon. It's much more like the 1940s than it is like the 1970s. And I would argue it's tame relative to the 1940s because we, again, even the 1940s, you had significant population growth and destruction of capacity that you just don't really have this time around, except for places like Ukraine to a lesser extent, Russia. Uh, and that could change. I just want to emphasize that. But what it what it leads me to believe is is that the inflation rate, the eight and a half percent that you just saw, that is likely to fall even as prices don't retreat back to the level that we that we were used to beforehand. Right. So, chicken doesn't go back to you know a dollar a pound. It stays at two dollars or four dollars a pound, but it's not going to eight next year. Right. This is not a massive currency debasement risk. And the other unfortunate thing is, is that the, because central banks took this politically unpopular stance of saying inflation is transitory, it made them appear out of touch with the reality that the average American or average person was experiencing around the world. And as a result, they're now being forced into a rearguard action to try to fight inflation at the exact same time that the inflation rate does actually appear to be retreating, right? And the underlying conditions of demand destruction are creating the conditions under which prices will at least stop going up and potentially could retreat. Um, you know, you're hearing the same intransigence from the Fed that they talked about inflation last year. Now you're hearing them talk about growth that way as well, right? Well, we see no signs growth is slowing. And meanwhile, the rest of us are looking around going, what are you talking about? Growth is slowing everywhere. Right. Um, but they're kind of trapped. And that's that's not a good situation to be in. You don't want your 
you know, policymakers being forced to make decisions or stick to a narrative, for example, zero COVID tolerance, because it just leads to bad policy. We're seeing that in China. I would argue we're starting to see that in the United States. Do you think so? Do you think the risk here is that the Fed hikes too much and they cause a recession? Do you think that's the biggest risk? I think we've already done that. Okay. Oh, wow. It's, it's funny because I was, I was, Josh Wolf actually on Twitter had something very similar to that um, recently. And his, his take was basically that he didn't think the Fed would ever hike again or after like the cycle would end with this current hike um, because basically the economic conditions would be deteriorating and you know, whatever, whatever it was. Um, he thought this, there was a potential this would be the last hike. Yeah. I, I, so I actually, I, so I, the only thing I disagree with Josh is I think we have one more hike, right? Because I think the Fed basically doesn't have the chops to back away and say, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be discretionary about this after all, right? I think they actually feel themselves as trapped. They need to show that they're going to go through this. But the unfortunate reality is the discussion that we use is what's called the neutral rate in the economy, right? We need to go to the neutral rate. You know, like there's like some light switch, right? You know, we get to that level and like, okay, now we can turn off inflation or we can do this. What I think both Josh and I would argue is, is that that model is fundamentally flawed. So, so instead of thinking of a neutral rate, think of that neutral rate as basically the center of a distribution that looks somewhat normal, right? Which means that when you get to that level, half the people are already dead, right? And so like, that's the core of the problem is, is that the Fed is going to this quote unquote aggregate level where it's like, okay, well, at what point does Microsoft begin to suffer distress? Microsoft will never suffer distress. They have way too much cash. They have a complete monopolistic franchise in some areas of it, Apple, not dissimilar at all, right? So you have these, these criteria under which they have no need for or no concerns about higher interest rates. In fact, their treasury would probably benefit from higher interest rates. But there's a ton of companies out there that people work for, that people rely on to supply stuff, et cetera, that have zero capacity to handle higher rates. And we're seeing that in the high yield market, which has shut down its refinancing conveyor belt, right? It's just done. Europe has not had a, had a high yield refinancing in over two months. The United States has basically seen one deal get done in the past two months, one significant deal get done, and that turned into a complete disaster and has destroyed the appetite to do anything else, right? So like we're already breaking stuff all over the place. And that's in the developed world. If I extend that to the emerging markets, it's out, like it's really out of control. They cannot handle a higher dollar and higher commodity prices because what we see as oil prices going to give or take 110, they see as oil prices going to 150 or 200. Just um, two more sort of questions here as we um, wrap this up and you've been really generous with your time. So we uh, very much appreciate it. But um, is, is there anything else you're think like big picture stuff, sort of like the passive? I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about the implications of that and developing that um, theory with the data and the research, but are there other areas that you're sort of thinking about within the markets right now that you're spending time sort of developing a similar type theory or where are your interests right now as you look sort of in the market and what's going on? Um, I mean, the area that I'm most focused on right now is is what I think is, is the Fed being backed into a mistake, right? Um, you, you know, everything that you've heard me talk about in equity markets is also true in fixed income markets. It ranges from derivative exposures that contribute to outsized movements um, that unfortunately Fed policymakers or policymakers in general misinterpret as information. So I just give as a, as a really simple example, the, the dynamics that I was just highlighting on the true stress that exists around the world in terms of sourcing US dollars in order to pay for commodities I would argue is contributing to the sell-off that we're seeing in interest rates in the long end, right? So one way to think about a, a 30 year bond is it is a commitment to return a small fraction of dollars in the interim and a large fraction of dollars 30 years from now, right? That's a potentially valuable instrument until you enter into a regime where you are right now, where Japan, for example, has shifted from being an export, a trade uh, surplus country to a trade deficit country needs to import things like energy at the same time that it's selling. And I'm not going to I'm going to be somewhat dismissive and understand. I obviously don't think this is true, but they're selling, you know, semi useless trinkets, right? Um, you, you know, like 
Do I really need a TV? No. Do I really need to eat? Yes. Right? What Japan needs has gone up in price far more than their capacity to supply and sell stuff that is nice to have. That's creating conditions under which Japan has a relative shortage of dollars today with which to buy the stuff that it needs. Food imports, fertilizer, um, natural gas in LNG form, right? Gasoline from refinery operations, etc. All of those are in short supply. They're scrambling to obtain dollars. And one of the ways that you do that perversely is I sell the claim on dollars that I have 30 years into the future for a pile of dollars today, right? That sends the signal that interest rates are going up and that the Fed is potentially behind the curve and we're facing inflationary conditions, even as what I just described to you is a fantastically deflationary condition in which you're basically burning the furniture to keep warm today. We um, tend to ask our guests a standard closing question and you can relate it to I, maybe this, you know, what you're sort of, what, what you just talked about or anything you want really. But um, what we like to ask is based on your experience in the market and the research that you're doing, if you could impart one piece of wisdom or teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? Well, the, the one thing that I would highlight to people, and, and it's a phrase that I use all the time, is why are you reading this now, right? It's a variant of Ben Hunt's narrative dynamics, right? Which is why are you suddenly being treated to this information today? Because it's not being, you know, the, the news is not being sold to you for your benefit. It's being sold to you for the benefit of somebody else, right? Whether it's to sell advertising dollars, whether it's to place propaganda, whether it's to engender loyalty to a particular news organization, etc. Why are you receiving this information now? And I would, by and large, highlight that a lot of the information that we're receiving right now is designed to effectively cause people to go into a frantic um, uh, type of behavior where they're saying, oh my God, abortion rights are going away, or oh my God, you know, all the kids are going to die, or oh my God, like I, I have to do what my party, what my tribal affiliation tells me I have to do. The more effective you are at removing the emotional component and the, the panic that is associated with the narrative that is being thrown at you, right? Ben Hunt very successfully uses things like Bitcoin and, you know, exclamation points, right? The more effective you are at saying, why am I being told this? Why am I being sold this piece of information? The better you're going to be at critically evaluating that information that's presented to you. And I, I would just encourage people that much of the information that we're being provided with today is designed to engender a response. It's designed to engender tribal loyalty. You have to do this, otherwise you can't be part of the tribe because clearly people who don't do this are part of another tribe. We're all members of the human race. We're all here to benefit in a collective sense as well, at the same time that we're trying to succeed on an individual sense. And so just try to take a little bit of a deep breath and look at what's going on around you and be maybe more calm in the assessment of, of what your response should be. Good stuff. Thank you, Mike. We'll put links to Simplify in the show notes. We'll drop the slides in um, in the places that it's appropriate. If uh, Is there any place else uh, if people want to learn more about you um, and follow your research, they can um, go to learn more? Yeah, if I didn't bore the hell out of you in that hour, um, you can find me on Twitter at ProfPlum99. Totally random um, character. Looks like Vicini from The Princess Bride, but P-R-O-F-P-L-U-M 99. Um, you can also find me on the Simplify website where you can find some of my writings and some of the analysis that we've done, the presentations, media appearances, etc. And then um, we have our own podcast that's distributed on a monthly basis called Keeping It Simple. You can sign up for it on our YouTube channel or, again, access it through our website. And I like to think that's actually pretty good. We, t we try to bring in super high quality guests um, that have interesting things to say about either particular components of the market or strategies as it relates to equities, fixed income, et cetera, or discussions around topics like inflation, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. And I do that with my, my business partner and long-term friend, Harley Bassman, who is the genius behind some of our interest rate products. Great. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Absolutely a pleasure, guys. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant 
and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.